when Tanzanite was discovered, um, it wasn't called Tanzanite. What was it originally called, and do you remember that story? The Souza, Manuel de Souza, made a discovery. He had a blue stone. He, uh, the man was a terror, and he made a jacket for himself, which included a pocket which was the right size for his mineral identification book. He found this blue stone, looked in his book, and the thing that he thought matched it best was the mineral olivine. In fact, it's not a very good match at all. Olivine uh, doesn't look like Tanzanite. <laughs> and, uh, but the uh, laws of Tanzania require that when you put down the post to have a mining right, you had to say what it was that you were mining. Yeah. So he put down the word olivine. Uh, I don't think this caused him any trouble. Perhaps it did. I don't know that part of the story. And uh, in the course of time, other names were proposed. Uh, Dumartyrite, uh, uh, Cordyrite, uh, uh, I think there was another one too, and uh, which were also incorrect. And the identification was actually made, the first identification, proper identification as a zoocyte, was done in the DOMA by the Mines Department, uh, Tanzanian Geological Survey. Almost immediately thereafter, uh, Connie Halbert at Harvard and one of the German professors came up with the identification already. But we had already heard the name uh, zoocyte in East Africa before these various uh, papers, uh, learned articles, uh, start to reach us and visitors would come through and say zoocyte. No, we knew it already, yeah. Um, when it comes to the naming of Tanzanite, now I understand that this is my understanding of the Tanzanite story and how it got its name. Mm -hmm. Your father was the vice president at Saks on Fifth Avenue, correct? Yes, Saks Fifth Avenue was the name of the uh, place. Yeah. And there were two vice presidents, one for personnel and one for merchandise. And my father was the vice president in charge of merchandise. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he visited you in Kenya. No, no, no it wasn't no, Kenya. No, 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 no. I sent it to him. I exported okay. it to him. And uh, he took it across the street. There are three things that are very close to one another here. He took it across the street to the GIA yeah. to get an identification. And then they sent him to a building somewhere very nearby. Uh, to get the stones cut and then he brought them downstairs to the uh, jewelry uh, department which was one of his departments the same way that furs or shoes or yeah. handbags were and the fellow in charge of the jewelry department says oh I don't think Sax wants to get involved with rough stones <laughs> uh, I regret that yeah. <laughs> and then my father took it across the street in the other direction to Tiffany's, yeah, and then I think you know the rest of the story. I, I do, and I've got to ask you this question because I was uh, there's so many different stories around gemstones often and how they're discovered, and so Tanzanite uh, is a little like that. Um, I understand the story I know is that it was yourself, Henry Platt, and your father that came up with a name Tanzanite over a, a steak at an Italian restaurant in New York. And yeah, that, that, that's what I heard, but I understand that's not true. I wasn't in that <laughs> restaurant. I was in, I was in East Africa. <laughs> I, I, I absolutely love that because it just, it's so nice to be able to hear direct from the source. Because you hear, so, it's certainly with all gemstones, you hear so many stories about how they're discovered and when they were discovered. And that, so you, were, you weren't categorically, you weren't in New York having a steak. I wasn't in New York <laughs> at all. Uh, and, and the rest is history. That name Tanzanite sort of stuck thereafter. Yes. Uh, let's face it, uh, Tiffany's put in a great deal of effort and a great deal of money with advertising. And uh, you've seen many of those clippings from going back to yeah. the 19th. Yeah. And uh, it's not that they made this stone, or maybe they did make this stone, but would have been made in any case. It's such a nice item. It's such a very nice item. That, uh, but uh, Tiffany's got their first on the market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, John, great uh, to, to, to chat to you today. I wanted to talk to you about 
uh, gemstone mining and East Africa and Tanzania, Kenya. So that, that kind of whole region, why do you think that is so rich for gemstones? Why is that the area that, that we seem to find most gemstones? Uh, when you're talking about gemstones, you're talking about uh, transparent colored yeah. gemstones, right? Yeah. Okay, because the, there are opaque things like jade, for example, yeah. and I've got no opinion on, on that. And uh, the deposits of the transparent colored gemstones will be in Brazil, will be in Namibia, will be in East Africa, Madagascar, Sri Lanka, and those are places that were involved in uh, uh, continental collisions and we actually have a date for it about 550 million years ago, half a billion years ago. And uh, those collisions generated friction and they produced a quantity of heat which is really exceptional in, the geolog in geological history. I mean, gemstones are exceptional, so you needed yeah. exceptional conditions to produce them. And that extra dose of heat enabled the stones to crystallize with less pressure, less deep in the earth. So a little, little bit higher, just a little bit. Uh, I don't think anyone's prepared to say whether it's measured in uh, meters or uh, kilometers, yeah. but, uh, but higher nevertheless. And that means less constraining pressure, which means better conditions for crystallization. And in my opinion, the difference between East Africa and say Brazil or uh, Madagascar is that the collision, instead of being like this or like that, I think it was a really long grind okay. between the t generating a lot of heat for a long period of time. That's why I think East Africa is different from some of these other places. Yeah. It's just incredible when you think about like, that's what created the, um, a lot of the gemstones that we see today. What was your, um, you've been working with gemstones for a long time. Yes. What is it? that makes you fall in love with um, nature's treasures, if you like? I think for me, it's the idea that they're exceptional. Uh, uh, when I was a student, uh, we had field trips to lots of places. We never saw anything that was as nicely crystallized like that. And then I was in East Africa for other reasons. And my gosh, there were all these different stones. Uh, they weren't pouring out of the ground, but people would bring it in from time yeah. to time. And uh, instead of an opaque this or an opaque that, it was a transparent this or a transparent that, yeah. It's uh, specific to that part of the world. Or, and if you, or if you want those parts of the world, if you want to include Brazil and yeah. Sri Lanka. Yeah. And a journey that set you on a path for the oh, rest of your life. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, if, is there... Um, is there, do you have a favorite gemstone? I was asked that many times. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm happy with uh, anything that looks a bit unusual. Yes, if it's transparent, yes. I think it's a good answer. I like it has a couple of crystal faces, preferably, yeah, yeah, absolutely. 